Hello and welcome back to another KCC video, I'm Rob and today we'll be jumping into Pro Revenge. Our first story today comes to us from Barbecue in Hell. You demand we work overtime for free? Enjoy trying to open the store with no employees. Let's jump right in. I've met Grumpy in Narcotics Anonymous. He volunteered there after they helped him and became my sponsor. Seeing that I was trying to get my crap together, he offered me my first job out of high school. Grumpy was the manager of a store for a company that sold everything you needed to build a house. From cement and bricks to custom made cupboards, I started as a loader, filling the trucks that were making deliveries. A little background for the company, it plays an important part later. When they started back in the early 80s, they sold everything you needed to build a brick and mortar home wholesale to professionals. During their first expansion, they got a really good reputation for their prices of power tools, custom cupboards, and landscaping, including custom-made garden furnitures. The stores were basically big warehouses. In mid-90s, they opened their doors to the general public, which, accompanied by a rising tent of DIY, skyrocketed their sales. That brought a second, smaller wave of expansion and the opening of the online store, first only with phone orders and later with a proper site. When I joined, they were doing a third shift on their business plan. They had cut down on things that weren't a big seller, like bricks and concrete, and were focusing more on the big sellers, custom-made furniture, landscaping, tools, and for some weird reason, plumbing. My first eight months on the job was a dream. Grumpy was an excellent manager. Having started in the company roughly the same age I was and being promoted through the ranks had developed a very distinct managerial style. His concept was simple. If my employees are happy, they work better and provide better services, which leads to better sales. That meant that while Grumpy managed one of the inner city stores, meaning medium to small size compared to others, we were fourth in revenue nationwide and first in customer happiness. And then the reason for his nickname stroke. While everyone called him Grumpy, a nickname he was kind of proud of, he was far from it. The reason was he had a medical condition that affected his nerves and had left him with a permanent frown on his face. He had declined promotion due to that condition, knowing the extra stress would make his condition flare up, meaning he wouldn't be as effective as he would like. His medical condition flared up unexpectedly, and Grumpy had to be hospitalized and be on sick leave for a time. HQ decided to not have one of Grumpy's assistants be an acting manager for the duration, but bring in a regional manager to take over the store for the duration. Let's call him Wilhelm. Wilhelm was the exact opposite of Grumpy. He was younger than Grumpy. He was in his late 20s. Grumpy was in his late 30s, had a business degree, and he hadn't worked the floor at all. He was hired from the beginning as an office drone and climbed his way to regional manager. The reason he was put in charge of our store had to do with the change of the business plan of the company. You see, the change of focus had created a lot of empty space in the stores. A supermarket chain had approached the company with an offer to rent the empty space, especially for inner city stores. The company had accepted and placed regional managers in key stores to help with integration. The thing is, the supermarket chain had a reputation of being bad employers. That was reinforced by one of our tellers, who had worked for them for three years before quitting to join us. Wilhelm didn't help also. His managerial style was based in only one concept, make more money in any way possible. He started by changing our schedule from monthly to weekly, raising the sales targets to unrealistic heights, and always demanded more. In the first two weeks, six experienced people had left, four quit and two fired, and replaced by young, inexperienced people that were easier to manipulate. And then the integration happened. The floor was the first to feel the problem. The supermarket opened its doors and was understaffed. Wilhelm started sending people over to help for four to six hours, while also demanding to work their regular shifts. If someone declined, he or she was written up. Two write-ups in six months, and you were fired. Then, Wilhelm came to lay the law in the loading bay. The loading bay was shared between the two stores, Wilhelm declared that we had first helped the two guys of the supermarket unload their trucks first because their products were perishable and then started loading our own trucks. That would throw our delivery schedule to the wind. The loading crew worked 5 a.m. to 1 p.m. We loaded first the trucks that had longer to travel so they will be ready to leave at 7 at the latest. The company had a next day delivery policy for a 150 mile radius. What Wilhelm declared meant we couldn't start loading our trucks before 7.30, and they couldn't start their route before 9.30. We said as much, but Wilhelm didn't care. He said we had to do both jobs. 
when someone inquired about overtime, Wilhelm said no. He said we are already made too much money with unsocial hours, 5 to 8, and leaving early, so he wouldn't approve overtime. So, from a nice environment that you wanted to work for, we all started getting miserable. We lost 10 people in the loading crew in a month because of the new rules. The new hires didn't last long. The floor was a mess also. Started turning personnel faster than a dollar hooker. Anyone who is staying is either looking for another job, is afraid of unemployment, or is too young to know better. The sales had a very small decline, but customer happiness is plummeting fast. After almost six months, all the old guard that was left was ready to quit, but our savior came back. Almost six months from the day he was hospitalized, Grumpy walks in the store to claim his rightful position. He isn't a knight in shining armor riding a pure white horse, carrying a legendary sword. He is in a normal attire, slightly limping and holding a cane. We have a welcome back party and have a small glimmer of hope now he is back. We are informed that Grumpy will be on light duties for two weeks before he becomes the manager again. Despite Grumpy being back, Wilhelm still remains the regional manager, which means he outranks Grumpy and makes it very clear in private meetings with all of us. If he caught us complaining to Grumpy, we were as good as gone. Still, a few of us are planning to have a meeting with Grumpy after the weeks, letting him get his sea legs back, but another department had other ideas. During his reign of terror, the only department that Wilhelm couldn't control was the workshop. He knew that if he treated them as bad as he did to us, they would quit and the sales would go from a small decline to bottom of the barrel real quick. As I said, custom made furniture was the number one seller. So the head carpenter has a meeting with Grumpy on his second day, talking about the future of the workshop. In reality, the guy spilled the beans on Wilhelm. With the pretext of catching up with the changes, Grumpy has meetings with everyone, learning what Wilhelm had done and why we had so many new staff. You could feel he was getting angrier with every meeting. He had also had an eye-opening meeting with the manager of the supermarket. Finally, the time had come that he is the manager again. The Revenge On his first day back as manager, Grumpy notifies everyone of a mandatory meeting after the store is closed. He has a solution. So gather in the store after closing hours and Grumpy lays out the plan. For the next couple of days, nobody except him is coming to the store. If anyone calls us, we should direct them to him, which we did when we started getting calls about the store being closed. Grumpy's answer to the HQ was simple. The staff was working on a second job during their shifts, which is a breach of contract. So I had to fire them all and find new staff. That caught HQ's attention because nothing of the sort was reported in the past six months. They asked Grumpy for evidence, which he happily provided with our written testimonies, which brought a crap storm on Wilhelm. You see, Wilhelm had an arrangement with the supermarket manager. He got a kickback from our unpaid labor for the supermarket, and the manager offered the same thing to Grumpy. He also included that Wilhelm regularly declined to sign overtime, which meant that if any one of us went to the labor department, the company would get a really huge fine. The Aftermath Wilhelm quickly got fired. We all received calls to interview with the company for an open position. We all received severance pay for our firing, plus most of the unpaid overtime, about 80% of it. Almost all of us went back to work with a small pay raise based on experience. The company took a long, hard look on the supermarket chain and distanced themselves from them. They stayed until their lease was over, but no shared employees anymore, and a lot of theirs jumped ship to our side. Next time Grumpy had to take time off, one of his assistants took over. Two did a stellar job, leading to be promoted to managers in other stores. Grumpy brought back his usual managerial style, leading again to a rise of sales and customer happiness. I left the job three years later for a better paying position, but I still remember Grumpy as one of the best managers I ever had. So something I didn't read at the beginning, but OP mentioned that English wasn't their first language. And what I'm starting to notice is that people who don't have English as a first language, we can usually expect better English than native English speakers. Going back to what we've said many times, bad managers make people quit. People don't generally quit a job, they quit a manager. So if you have a good one, you need to hold onto them tight. Make sure they don't leave. Do me a quick favor, have a look down below the video. If that subscribe button's still red, it means you're not actually subscribed to the KCC channel. Please hit that subscribe button for more daily Reddit stories. Our second story today comes to us from Little Miss Bunny Woman. Harass me, treat me like crap, that's gonna cost you five years salary. Let's jump right in. 
First, some background. A bit over six months prior to the start of this story, we had a change up at the company I worked for. The old owner was a great guy that was retiring and handing the company off to his son, a real POS just out of business school type. The son, with the mentality that the company is now his, went about restructuring, namely reassigning teams to different projects and leaving those that remained in their old positions to pick up double, if not triple the workload. He did this all in the name of saving a little money. Unfortunately, my department, safety and engineering, of which I was the team lead, was not spared from this effort. In the end, I had it out with the boss and department head, ultimately costing the company three months of my entire department, working 80 plus hour weeks, and forcing a huge year-end bonus to be paid out to us. Unfortunately, after my initial meeting with the new boss, The Sun, he took a liking to me in a really bad way. Essentially, he really liked me and wanted to go out with me or sleep with me or however you want to put it. He even enlisted his friends and secretaries to help him. It went on for months, just blatant sexual harassment. They even made comments about me losing my late husband that I should just get back on the horse, so to speak. I kept everything, every email, every voicemail, and went to my best friend who happens to be a really good lawyer, a contract lawyer to be exact, so not exactly their area of expertise, but they knew enough to help. This friend drafted a letter to the boss, essentially a stop or we're going to start a big case over this kind of thing, and yeah, everything stopped. However, I was then moved from working in office to a work from home arrangement. I knew what was coming. They were going to do their best to get rid of me. So I started documenting everything. But as luck would happen, I received an email chain from the bosses. A good friend of mine in the office who was in the email chain added me to the CC list. And wouldn't you know, it was back and forth communication of them discussing how they would get rid of me and pin the blame on me. The email chain was just disgusting. They hated me so badly and wanted me gone. But because of my contract, they would have to buy me out. Out. But being the cheapskates they are, you know, they wanted me gone for free. So the company bosses started a campaign to try and torment me. They first tried to say that because I now work from home, they were required to install cameras in my home office to make sure I was being productive. Luckily, that did not work. You have to love contracts. They also tried assigning an impossible workload to me, but luckily my team and I were almost like family and they picked up the slack. After three months of this crap, I get an email and a phone call from the HR department saying I was getting laid off indefinitely because there was just no work for me. This was complete BS, given that we had several dozen projects we were working on. On a side note, in Ontario, there is no such thing as a layoff, as in the court's eyes, being laid off is considered an active dismissal, which is essentially the same as being fired. After this conversation with HR, I call my lawyer friend, almost in tears, just shouting, look what they are doing to me, help! She calms me down and tells me, this is such a good thing, we have so much evidence against them. I had already forwarded and printed everything off that was sent to me, and I was lucky I did, because a scant few hours later I was laid off, my computer was remotely wiped clean, everything was gone, leaving just a blank desktop. When I called the HR department to get copies of all my filed complaints, what do you know, everything was gone. In their place was a bunch of BS reprimands that never happened, that I never signed or saw, dating months and months back, and all signed by the new boss, despite the fact that they were dated before he ever took control of the company. It was clear they were total BS, but I got copies of everything to add to my stack of records. I texted all my old colleagues to let them know what was happening and that I am basically gone. Like I said earlier, we were like family, and with me on the way out, they started looking for better employment. Not only that, but they contacted all their friends who worked for the company to do the same. I was laid off on a Monday, and on Thursday, I walked into the office with my employment lawyer. I swear, the main secretary was on the phone to security the second she saw me walk in, and they were at the door in a matter of a minute. My lawyer simply handed her a legal document, a summons to meet for mediation at his office on the next Friday. During the following week, I received so many calls and text messages from the bosses, friends, secretaries, and people I knew in the office to just be friendly with the owner, to just drop it, and that they wanted to bring me back and forget about everything. Like hell, I was going back to such a hostile work environment. Friday finally comes, and into my lawyer's office, my former boss walks in with a squad of four of his lawyers to settle the matter. And off the bat, he offers me three months severance to end all of this 
because I didn't have any evidence to rebut the fake paperwork they had on file. At this point, my lawyer starts to bring out all the paperwork we had, namely copies of every complaint I had ever filed, which were all signed by the bosses, HR, and myself. Luckily for our case, I had made sure to take a copy of each complaint when it was written up. They didn't think I had anything? Oh boy, were they wrong. My lawyer made the case that in court, it'd be obvious that all the paperwork they had on their end were forgeries, nothing was signed by me, and he pointed out that there were dates with the boss's signature where he wasn't in the country, let alone working for the company yet, and at that point, the boss and his lawyers went to speak privately. After about a half an hour, they came back with a much better offer, a full year's salary. But my lawyer was like, nah, we'll just go with what the contract says, plus go for damages in court. Given the recent changeover at the company, the lawyers seemed to know they couldn't afford this going to court, not to mention, it would be so bad for the company's reputation. So they basically rolled over and asked, what do you want? We demanded five years salary, plus the average bonus I would have made for each year, plus all the legal fees paid. It was a big win, but it didn't end there. I got a taste of blood and wanted more. I made phone calls to several companies where I had contacts and found jobs for every member of my team and several members of other teams. By the end of a week, the company lost 10 of its most talented people. Not to mention, most of those people had friends and colleagues that ended up following them to their new employers. The fallout was pretty bad. Before all of this, they had the pick of the litter when new university students graduated, but now, because they lost almost all of their senior people, they had no one to mentor new employees. Plus, word got out fast how they treat workers like crap, so no one with any talent would even think of getting near the company. As of today, the company is just a shell of its former self. It's still big, but it bleeds money. They also now have a problem with permanent staffing and are paying out the nose to hire subcontractors. Let's just say they don't make money like they used to. In fact, they have not started any new projects in something like nine months. If something isn't done on the side of management to improve things fast, they will likely be going bankrupt in the very near future. Can you imagine the dad that passed the company down to his son thinking it was going to be a good thing, they'd have a nice stable job and a good base to build on, and then they pretty much just throw it all away? This is the pinnacle of disappointment. Thank you to both OPs for posting their stories in the Pro Revenge subreddit. They are linked in the description down below. Please go check them out. Check out one of these other videos, and if you haven't yet, please hit that subscribe button for more daily Reddit stories.